बचा लेना जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट केयरफुली The scene and the stage are set for the 23rd Vijay Divas. As we know, this is the 23rd anniversary of the victory in the war in Kargil. Just so happened that 26th of July, Vajpayee government said all operations are over, all infiltrators or Pakistani occupiers have been evicted, and all of India's territory has been recovered. And that's when they said the war is over, and Mr. Vajpayee. went to atal bihari bajpayee went to the ops room in army headquarters and as he was coming out he said operation vijay is a great vijay operation vijay as we know was the name of the uh, larger operation in which army air force and also the navy were involved i'll tell you a bit about that in that operation so that was declared to be over and victory was declared now you might say that so many books have been written about the war in kargil so many articles so many memoirs by soldiers who served there and many memoirs also by journalists reporters young reporters who covered the war the, bat- the many battles movies have been made some with a lot of fantasy in fact most with some degree of fantasy but but some with some degree of more than the usual degree of realism as well now after all that what is left to talk about the war in kargil now we have we have a rich bit of literature in india on this i have three in my bookshelf right here this is general vp malik's book uh, kargil uh, he was then uh, the chief of army staff kargil from surprise to victory uh, so yeah, he begins by admitting that india were india were surprised and then he talks about how this was turned around into victory uh, there is also a book by air commodore jasjeet singh who was one of our preeminent defense experts and i have the pleasure to say that at one point of time after he had retired from idsa where he used to be director he had also helped us he, had, he was our consulting editor for strategic affairs at the indian express so this is a book by him kargil 99 pakistan's fourth war for kashmir this is very well documented with a lot of data uh, not easily available in market and then what is my favorite book uh, this is a ridge too far by amrinder singh the amrinder singh captain amrinder singh because amrinder singh most people know him as a politician but he is by far india's finest and the most detailed military historian he comes up with the most granular detail how granular it is sometimes you might think that this is too granular for the civilian or somebody not interested in military affairs like his book on the 1965 war his reconstruction with his friend and colleague uh, lieutenant general t s shergill on the 1965 war which both served as young officers the book is called the monsoon war nevertheless this is a very detailed uh, reconstruction of the war and gives you a very non partisan as non partisan as, as you can be from one side account but you know warfare uh, is the most polarizing thing military battles war is for obvious reasons the most polarizing things one side each side is on its own side and so are the historians journalists everybody you can see it happening right now between in the ukraine russian war, war as well because war is divisive the other side is the enemy and that's why something like flags of our fathers and also the sequel then letters from iwo jima that is how the japanese had would have seen the war from their end because there were two sides fighting in iwo jima that that becomes such an interesting and important and brave thing to do now kargil we don't have anything very similar done from the indian side about what happened on the pakistani side but we have some accounts and books and one of the more detailed accounts now many accounts have come from the pakistani side musharraf has written his uh, autobiography uh, self serving as you would expect it to be 
Nawaz Sharif has given many interviews. He was the Prime Minister at that time. Benazir Bhutto had many given many interviews, also written about her herself. She wasn't the Prime Minister when Kargil happened, but she has spoken in detail about a similar similar plan that had been presented to her much earlier when she was Prime Minister the second time. Exactly the same plan in many ways, and she also talks about in that interview uh, what what her responses were, and I will come to that. But one of the books that that actually the entire book is not about Kargil. This is a book called Crossed Swords, and this is a book by a Pakistani writer, analyst, historian called Shuja Nawaz. Shuja Nawaz lives in the U.S. Uh, he wrote this book. He's written a bunch of books, but this book in particular. Crosswords, basically, uh, if you see the subtitle that explains the book, this is Pakistan, its army, and the wars within. So he has given us granular account of what of what was happening within the Pakistani army brass and between them and the political establishment when this war took place, how this was planned, and how it happened. So not to go into too much detail. If you just get to if if you just get to about page. 513, 14, 15, 16, or thereabouts in this book, you will find a lot of account of what's happening there. 514, 13 in particular, you will see those pages on my screen also. But the book is available in soft copy. You can go and read it. Now, he says, he says that for a long time, Pakistani army had thought particularly after India occupied, India beat the Pakistanis in the race for Siachen in 1984 uh, in the course of Operation Meghdoot, which you, uh, most of us are familiar with. Pakistani army was chafing. They, they were sort of smarting and they wanted to get even. So that was tactically, that was one issue. The second thing was because you know, after all, Siachen is what was described on the Pakistani side, he mentions as an extreme infantry operation. And in an extreme infantry operation, Indian army had beaten the Pakistani army. So there was reason why they, that was the reason why they were smarting. So they wanted to get even in some way. And one way of getting even, the obvious target was get on top of Kargil on those mountains and target that section, that section of National Highway, Indian National Highway 1A, connecting Srinagar and Ladakh and Leh, which was visible from those mountains. So you target that highway there. So India will not be able to move its convoys, will not be able to, uh, to, to resupply its troops in Ladakh. And maybe in the course of time, at least at the minimalistic level, once India realized, quote unquote, that it was impossible now for them to maintain their troops, supplies, food, ammunition, etc., etc., in Ladakh, which also means in Siachen, they might agree to settle, they might sue for peace or a settlement in Siachen. That was on the minimalistic side. On the maximalistic side, if you see his account, the idea was that you become so dominant there and you make India's life so impossible. Meanwhile, the Kashmir issue gets internationalized that India has no choice but to get into serious discussions, a serious negotiation on Kashmir and arrive at a settlement, obviously with some great concessions for the Pakistanis. That was on the, that was on the maximal, maximalist side. And this is what was then going on. Now, he says, for example, uh, in the book, that Kargil is not an area that only got contested in 1999. These Kargil Heights were the first areas that the Pakistani army occupied when they got fully involved in uniforms etc in 1948 until then they were carrying out again the pretense of using the mujahideen or the or the tribal guerrillas but once they got actively openly involved then they took these hills these same peaks some of these indian army took back in 1965 the rest Indian army took back in 1971. In fact, if you go to the other side of Kargil, as it abuts, say, the Ladakh region, say, Batalik region, as we call it. So the area of Turtok, Indian army occupied in 1971 and after. So in the Shimla Accord, any territory that either side had occupied across the line of control or what was then ceasefire line in Kashmir, that side retained. So Pakistan retained the tiny enclave of Cham, 
but india retained whatever they had taken in kargil and particularly going up towards batalik and then tutok so tutok tutok came under indian position in 1971 now the pakistanis thought that if they again got on to these peaks because they knew that in winter time indians withdraw from these peaks the local commanders knew it and then they come back and in any case it's difficult to keep 24 by 7 surveillance there so they decided to go there now this is a plan that they had worked on in the past they had worked on in the past and something that i don't think many of us would know about is that in 1990 they had made a military effort to take kargil again and that military effort was headed by a real character a real character i call him a prized idiot because i knew him well i as an i am not quoting from the author now because he was the pakistani defense attache or defense advisor in delhi in late 80s as a brigadier his, his name was brigadier zahirul islam abbasi now zahirul islam abbasi the late 80s were a bit bit permissive in delhi there were lots of parties a lot of pakistani diplomats came at those parties almost all of them would drink in fact all of them would drink would dr- could drink any indian under the table because they would they could drink so much but zahirul abbasi zahirul islam abbasi would not drink he was a puritan he would say on the other, other hand things like really communal things like tumhari hindu kaum fana ho jayegi tumhari aurte behaya ho gayi hain that your women have lost all sense of shame the hindu uh, community will destroy itself etc etc so he wasn't particularly loved in delhi he was particularly disliked in delhi and he was also not particularly particularly liked by spooks on our side and i shall not name for you who it might have been on our side who was playing this counter games that he was caught in a trap that only someone as stupid as him could get caught into so this was apparently an indian double agent from him he had himself gone to collect stuff brigadier saab the military advisor in pakistan high commission himself goes to collect stuff and i think it was somewhere near not far from where i said i think somewhere near asaf ali road or between asaf ali road and pahad ganj one of those places a trap was laid so brigadier saab got there to collect these papers and to deliver money to this indian double agent and that's when the ib and the police came delhi police came and caught him so he was caught in the act and declared persona non grata and thrown out of india now that is not something that was going to be held against him obviously because he went back and he was being such a pakka islamist and this is the time when the post zia pakistani islamized officers had begun to rise as they say the beards had begun to rise in pakistani army so he went back he got promoted he got promoted and what was the charge he got he was major general now and he was made force commander northern areas force commander northern areas means pakistanis have a special command for the kashmir region it's called fcna there is a history to it which i will not go into after 1970 war 71 war generally there was a decision that the two countries should not increase their army units in kashmir so pakistanis did not call it a command or head command, command headquarter they just called it force command northern areas that was a cover so he was force commander northern areas in 1990 1990 is when kashmir insurgency was at its peak vp singh was in power india's weakest government ever on issues of national security and then they thought this was a great moment to pay india back for siachen and more and maybe help the mujahideen take kashmir and what was that great opportunity that was to take kargil and brigadier zahirul islam abbasi of the delhi double agent <laughs> trap fame or infamy depending on how you look at it he was now a major general and fcna chief and he thought that he will launch an operation and he will take kargil which he did he launched that operation that operation went wrong a lot of his people got killed about 50 uh, of his troops got killed and 10 officers 10 officers got killed because they were trapped by the indian side and then to get them out and to re- resupply them 
In fact, situation got so desperate that one of his incredibly brave brigade commanders, General Saab, must have had three, four, five brigade commanders under him. One of his brigade commanders got into a helicopter to survey the area and to figure out if he could do something for his troops who had been trapped. That helicopter was shot by the Indian side. So the helicopter was shot down and Brigadier himself died. His name was Brigadier Masood Nawel. So Abbasi Saab also got his one of his brigadiers killed there. Abbasi Saab later uh, was caught in something else even more infamous and this time infamous in Pakistan. Later as a major general, he tried, he tried to stage a coup against his army chief, his army, his army commanders and also the prime minister of the day, which was Benazir Bhutto. He was caught, sent to jail later as these things happen in Pakistan because Fauji's have to be protected. He was released and when I last heard about him, he had joined some Tablighi Jamaat kind of organization in Rawalpindi or someplace. And he was preaching what he had preached all his life, which is basically uh, Islamic Puritanism. So, so there was a history to this. In 1990, they had tried this. 1992, they had planned this again. But once again, those plans were given up. Just a footnote, uh, who fired General Abbasi for being such a pain in the butt? It was then Army Chief, Pakistan Army Chief, General Asif Nawaz who incidentally happened to be a brother of Shujah Nawaz's. He had died, he had died in harness. Uh, he had died while on a car ride. He had a heart attack uh, and died, the army chief. Now in this book and so many other Pakistani accounts, there are Pakistani accounts from the other side also. There is this book by Shireen Mazari, who's been a well-known scholar in the strategic seminar circuit uh, and also was a minister in Imran Khan's government. Uh, that book seems to have been written from the Pakistani army's point of view because she had access to a lot of documentation, etc. And there she showed in that book that Nawaz Sharif, contrary to his claim, was in the picture on Kargil operations and later tried to disown it. So this is this is a raging controversy. This will never end in Pakistan. Now, Shuja Nawaz in his book also quotes a major general Irshadullah Tarar, who is a former commander also of FCNA, former force commander, northern area. So same area. He is quoted by Shuja Nawaz in his book as saying that, look, by this time, our army had become very Islamized. So a lot of the debate or discussion or even, even discussion over plans and strategy was not done professionally. It was done in a very Islamized manner. So there is a quote there that is quite telling. He says, quote, a lot of conversations, a lot of meetings, a lot of brainstorms would begin with something like, quote, by the grace of God, we will put 10,000 rounds over there and inshallah, the enemy will be routed, quote, closed. And then if somebody asks that, you know, but how much can you trust God? I mean, can God deliver all this if the odds are bad? So the answer was something like, again, quote, you cannot quantify God's grace. He also quoted the example of a 1992 operation. I told you there was one in 90, there was another one in 1992, although I suspect that was in the Siachen area. Even the first one uh, is, was not exactly in the Dras, Mashko kind of area, which became more, more familiar to us. It was somewhere more in the north, closer to closer to Turtok, Batalik, uh, Siachen, that kind of area. That was, that was Abbasi's disastrous operation. Now, he talks also about another operation in 1992 where a Pakistani officer and a bunch of soldiers had got trapped and there was no, no way to help them because they had been sent out and then they had got surrounded. So the court commander only said they are lucky that they achieved Shahadat, martyrdom. Now, once again, those scholars who followed this, journalists who followed this, followed this closely, might have read some of this. But again, for us in India, this is interesting. Now, Benazir Bhutto, in interviews, particularly an interview published in 2006, and that's also footnoted uh, in Shuja Nawaz's book, she talked about an incident or a happening 
in her second tenure as prime minister she said in her first tenure she wasn't so confident she was very young she suddenly became prime minister because zia got assassinated or died in a crash or whatever and she was a newbie and pakistani army was pretty much controlling everything the president had enormous power then gulam isa khan she said when she came to power the second time she was a bit more confident and she was given a similar presentation by the pakistani armed forces on a kargil like operation which they said will go and take shrinagar if you are familiar with the functioning of the armed forces you would know when armed forces plan an operation they do presentations and they do exercises and they put two sides so one side is their own side the other side it is the adversary side so as own side carries out the operations the adversary responds so you then figure out what can happen when the adversary responds so then pakistan they say they call themselves blue land and they call india fox land obviously because hindus are supposed to be so foxy i don't know whether that's the reason i'm just adding my little bit of facetious wisdom there in that interview she says that she was given this presentation by the pakistani armed forces where the commander of the blue land that is the pakistani side was general musharraf at that point general musharraf was a, was a major general and director general military operations and he was really gung ho about this operation the defender the commander of the fox land was an air force officer that air force officer was air marshal ayub meer now in that operation obviously because the army was on this side they showed that army was going to take over kashmir but at great cost so she says that musharraf said that pakistan will suffer greatly pakistan will lose sindh and lose punjab the pakistani punjab up to rahim yar khan so you can see on the map of pakistan how deep that is in punjab and then sindh so he said we we'll we we'll lose all that because indians will cut through uh, the empty plains of southern punjab now this also goes back to some to some scars the pakistanis were carrying from the 1986 87 exercise brass tacks carried out by general sundarji because that was the message of exercise brass tacks mobile warfare uh, lots of mechanized forces overwhelming the pakistani defenses but he said at the end of this we will capture kashmir so benazir bhutto said in that interview so what will happen when you capture kashmir musharraf said we'll capture shrinagar what will happen when you capture shrinagar we'll put the pakistani flag on the state assembly in shrinagar okay then what will happen then we will go to the un and we will tell the un now this is we've now conquered kashmir so change the geography change the map benazir bhutto says i said to him no such thing will happen even if you reach there shrinagar the un will say go back go back to where you were not only go back but even vacate pok pakistan occupied kashmir which she calls azad kashmir because remember those un resolutions they say first plebiscite then any country moving into these places so now we will be reminded that we have to go back even from azad kashmir or pak occupied kashmir and that is when she said that she put this down so this is something that had been brewing in the pakistani army and pakistani pakistani army's minds for a long time now what exactly happened in 1999 that the pakistanis finally did it now one reason could be that there was a sudden congregation of some islamist generals in key positions so commander of 10 core 10 core is generally in charge of this entire area based in rawalpindi so 10 core commander lieutenant general mahmood ahmed he was an islamist he later also joined tablighi jamaat so he was overseeing this area then chief of general staff lieutenant general mohammad aziz khan he had also been a bearded general in fact in the 80s until he was a brigadier he had a full flowing molana beard it's only when he became a general that he shortened his beard so he was an islamist also the so key two key positions with islamists the isi chief major taqir zia was doubtful he wasn't sure he should be doing this but the islamists won the day and they decided to go in now as they were deciding to go in 
and they marked out the 108 spots which they thought they will go and occupy along a 480 kilometer front. It wasn't a tiny area. It's not like the movies. 480 kilometers is a lot of distance. So on that front, 108 points they were to occupy, mostly from where they could look down on the highway and interdict Indian traffic. At that point, again, this account tells us that they had not carried out a staff check. What's a staff check? We told you that when armed forces make a plan, they always try to imagine or anticipate what will the adversary do. So within the group, somebody becomes the adversary and responds like the adversary. In this case, this wasn't done. There was so much overconfidence. So one officer, one senior officer decided to carry out a staff check of his own quietly. And he asked two officers, two fellow officers that you figure out if you were Indians, what would you do in this situation? And both said that we will bring our supplies, we'll bring our reinforcements, we'll bring artillery, etc., etc. That's exactly what India did at Kargil and, and turned the tide. But he says that his officer also, once in the armed forces, everybody decides that this is the way to go. Nobody, nobody wants to raise any objections. And, and that is the reason the, the Pakistani command also driven by some Islamists in key positions and a Musharraf whose IQ all of us have known about. He's, he's done more damage to his country and the subcontinent, frankly, for the past many decades. In fact, the most since Zia. In my book, he's done even more damage than Zia. So he walked his country into this awful disaster.